So uh, at Skype, uh, when there was anyone English speaking in the room, then we automatically switched to English. So I, I'll do the same here today uh, and uh, make sure that uh, this is a tradition that uh, uh, many uh, will follow. Uh, we are not here to uh, develop Estonian culture and language. We are here to make business, right? And most of the business, of course, happens in English in today's world. All right, so uh, uh, it's an honor, of course, uh, to be here. And thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, the uh, so short introduction about myself. Uh, I uh, worked at Skype uh, last eight years. I resigned uh, about a month ago. Uh, and um, I assure you that freedom is, is very good. Uh, but uh, last eight years, uh, I managed the testing team at Skype, so whenever there was a problem at Skype, I felt responsible because testing didn't catch those problems that were there. Uh, I'm also a member of, uh, uh, together with Thomas, a uh, uh, member of uh, uh, ITL, uh, that's Estonian IT and Telecommunications Association, uh, a member of the board there, and I'm responsible for the uh, workforce and IT education specifically as topic areas. Uh, I'm also head of uh, IT Academy, uh, which is a, uh, head of IT Academy steering committee, which is an initiative that uh, channels additional investments into Estonian IT education. So uh, today I'll talk about uh, a little bit about uh, Skype, so you understand where I'm coming from, why these topics that I'm gonna cover uh, are important. Um, and um, also try to pinpoint some obstacles that I've observed during, during my years at Skype uh, as obstacles doing business in Estonia and hopefully also provide some solutions. Uh, hope, uh, then uh, later on also I will talk a little bit about IT education in Estonia and what we're actually doing right now to make it better. Uh, so let's uh, get down to business. Um, where and who Skype is? Um, it's uh, actually a very not known fact that 34% uh, of all international long distance minutes in the world today are actually uh, done via Skype. Uh, so that makes Skype the biggest sort of telecom player in the world. Uh, and what is all more even re remarkable is that over 50% of those minutes are actually video minutes, which is uh, just, just amazing. It just happened in a few years. Um, the company is now part of Microsoft uh, happily for the last two years, uh, but the team is about 2,000 people, out of which 450 people still work in Estonia. And uh, Skype as a business is uh, around $1 billion business, so um, that's uh, sort of a size-wise, uh, quite, uh, no, no, quite uh, small in Microsoft context, but uh, still pretty big, uh, taking it on its own. Uh, so we all know that Skype was born in Estonia, and, uh, uh, that, but that, all, that was only possible because of the foreign help. Uh, the success story was a combination of timing, uh, people involved, relationships uh, and uh, the problem that they tried to address. And the problem was, of course, solve communication issues around the world. In Skype Estonia today, we have about 20% uh, people uh, from 38 different nationalities all over the world. And uh, male-female ratio is not so good, so, so uh, not too many technical programmers, uh, uh, but uh, uh, as ladies, but uh, Skype today is, of course, a very small team inside Microsoft, uh, which has uh, around 100,000 uh, employees. Uh, so uh, Skype is uh, Estonia. Skype Estonia is very uh, international, like I said, 38 different nationalities, and uh, um, they come from all sorts of different uh, countries. Uh, some neighboring countries are represented here, uh, but also some of the folks we had to get involved and get uh, joining Skype from very exotic places as well. And that has been a headache 
for quite, a, quite some time, actually. Uh, it's getting solved now in small steps, but um, uh, the way we hired people in the beginning was only through networks, and today we hire about 40% of people through networks. So uh, you want to get to work, you want to you work for Skype, you have to know someone uh, working at Skype, basically. So in the beginning, when we hired the first 100 people, this created such a, a remarkable commitment and accountability. So you, did, you were not only accountable for your employer or your product or your mission to change the world through com enabling communications, but you were also accountable to your friend who recommended you to come to work for Skype. Very, very powerful motivation, actually. Uh, so um, we grew from uh, zero to 450 people to, throughout the eight years. And of course, we did a lot of, uh, we sucked a lot of talent uh, from, from the Estonian market. Uh, and we also tried to give back, uh, especially last year when we had the possibilities to give back and participate in the collaboration activities with different universities. And um, uh, also, uh, a few years ago, uh, when the salary competition was very heavy, uh, I think the uh, throughout, uh, within the ITL, uh, actually the truce was made, sort of that we are not competing with salaries anymore. We tried to uh, try to uh, bring other aspects into play. So um, um, let's look at Estonian IT industry today. Uh, these are the numbers that um, um, Maris Lauri uh, shared uh, at uh, her um, presentation in Visionis uh, Lahendusteni. Beginning of this year, I believe, yes. And uh, in the Estonian IT industry, we today have roughly about 17,000 uh, jobs. And this includes cable guys, of course. Uh, uh, maybe a few thousand programmers, but uh, mostly these are technical people, technicians. Uh, and it's about 5.5% of the workforce. Uh, so we have 650,000 people. Uh, out of which 5.5% work in IT field. They generate a lot of GDP, uh, about 9%, and uh, in 2011 it equaled to 350 million euros. Uh, if you take, try to imagine that amount of money, then it, uh, it's about 20% of all uh, government spending on their, their employees or, or officials. And uh, it's about 30, 8% of all uh, government spend on education today in Estonia, and about 50% of all um, uh, medi medical costs uh, that government spends. And we pay for police and fire, guard, fire marshals, basically. 100% of the internal security costs equals 350 million euros in 2011. So IT overall contributes about 20% of the econo economic growth uh, over the last years. So it has been main driver for some of the economic growth uh, uh, amongst other industries as well. Uh, so um, uh, we today estimate that we need about 6,000 uh, people more into this business uh, by the year 2020. Just in a few weeks, uh, Praxis, Praxis will come out with the employment survey uh, where they highlight the need for IT uh, specialists uh, until year 2020. And this survey is made by projecting the economic growth and growth of the industry, uh, taking into account the growth that happened to, during the la last five years. Of course, the ITL has a bigger goal. Uh, we want to double the IT workforce from 17 to 34,000 uh, by the year 2020. And it's a very, very challenging task, actually. But it's, a, it's achievable uh, with, with something uh, that we know is possible in Estonia. So what it uh, means, I mean, uh, how you can get so, so many people involved into this business is that you bring in those Ericsons every, every year, basically. So Ericsson contributing 2,000 plus jobs in industry, we need to bring in more of those uh, development centers here. Or you, you will take uh, out about 10 startups from uh, 10 people to 100 people in a year. 
So if 10 startups will grow uh, during one year for 200 people, that is also uh, uh, equaling to the growth that we are envisioning for the future. And um, uh, so another question to think about is how many of those jobs are actually English speaking jobs? Not jobs that we can advertise more widely. Uh, because today uh, we get around uh, uh, 600 IT uh, uh, college, IT university graduates uh, every year, which is very, very little, you know. Uh, and most of, the, the, mo most of those people will work for IT field, but we lose about 30 to 40 percent who studied IT, but they work on some other field, actually. Uh, so uh, if you think about uh, IT jobs, we estimate today that we have about 2,000 jobs in Estonia today, which means that this sector has to grow as well. More of those uh, uh, companies have to envision themselves as international companies from the beginning. All righty. Um, so here is the first question. Uh, I, I think it's uh, in your uh, mobiles. Uh, you can vote. Uh, is your government, is our government doing enough to attract talent to our country? Uh, so you can answer in binary mode, yes or no. And I don't know how you actually present those results later on. Okay, yes. So, uh, so anyone who and, uh, very pro already seven responses and... Well, yeah, let's review them later. No, but uh, please do respond. Yeah, keep voting. Just, uh, <laughs> All right, so now we get into the whining part. Uh, and this uh, needs some refreshments because that's emotional section of the presentation. Um, some of those statements I'm going to list here are actually quite outrageous. Uh, you may even disagree, which is good. Then uh, my mission is done, you know. You think about it, you talk about it. Uh, hopefully we get to the right solution. Uh, so, um, um, some of the things are also self-evident. They are very logical. They are things to do. They seem to be doable, however they're not done for some reason. So the first thing uh, I want to mention is that uh, I've seen that so many times in Skype as well that perception is reality, but we think that we are reality. We think that what we say uh, is reality. What we say matters uh, or, or means what we say. Uh, in, in, in real life, as you all know, what the other hears is reality, of course, and what they want to hear is reality. So uh, when you think about those uh, fancy articles uh, in uh, Forbes or uh, Economist uh, talking about Estonia and stuff, why do you think those articles are so positive and so overwhelming? That's not because these guys uh, had their elevation or enlightening here in Estonia. That's because they came here with low expectations. That's why we are able to surprise them. That's where, I mean, and, and that perception here are, is low expectations. People come here, they see, oh, this is wonderful e-services, infrastructure, companies, uh, startups. This is all wonderful, but this is all surprise to them, actually. That's why we see so many positive articles. The other thing is that I haven't seen, when I'm reading in the international press, I, I'm not seeing Estonian news journalists writing articles about Estonia. The only guy is basically Toivo Danazu, who recently published Skype 10 years article in Ars Technica. He was the, basically the only guy. There are a couple of uh, people who do some collaborations with TechCrunch, etc. But there are very few. So we are not telling our own story at all, almost. So, but we are saved. We have, uh, we have Skype, which is uh, masking so many Estonian stories. And we have President Ilves, who is doing all the sales job for us, job that sh we should be doing every day. 
writing. Again, next one, quite controversial, but our, our own attitudes is the biggest friction point uh, that we see. And um, I have a couple of examples to uh, illustrate that. So all the journalists in the room, hands up. Okay, a couple of honest guys, fantastic. Uh, don't quote me, but you will. Basically, my claim is that uh, after Skype was invented uh, in Estonia at Skype, there have been many inventions after that in, with a similar, similar potential invented here in Estonia, but not sold, not advertised, not delivered, not convinced, not uh, uh, inventions that are in the drawer, basically. Solutions that might solve next technological issues, but not uh, sellable or not advertised enough, etc. So, and I believe in, it happens in other companies as well. Uh, there are very brilliant guys who know their stuff and uh, who are committed to solve certain problems, but they are unable to tell that to others, basically. This is a big, big problem. So it doesn't matter what we invent if nobody hears about it, right? The other is the um, concept I've, I've de developed about lack of hunger in Europe. And um, uh, lack of hunger in Europe comes in two ways. Western Europe is at their comfort zone. I mean, they're already living pretty well, right? They have their services running, you know, it's, it's pretty okay. Uh, they, are, they don't feel hunger, they are not thirsty. Right? For them, it's sometimes better just to l let things be like they are, right? For Eastern Europe, which is very hungry, we assume so, but I challenge that. We are not hungry because most of the people don't know what good looks like. Just an example here. We started the seminar, and this is not a critique. I fixed that problem myself. Thomas started to speak. He didn't have a clue where to shut down the music. He assumed somebody else should do that. But there was nobody worrying about the experience you guys get and the freedom of Thomas speaking without interruption. This is what good looks like when you have that person. But if you don't have that, that's the Eastern Europe for you, man. Basically, uh, we don't challenge ourselves and our colleagues enough to present well, to uh, do things better than anyone can imagine being able, able to do. So that's lack of hunger for Europe, the Eastern Europe side. All right. The next one. And this is, uh, of course, political, but uh, some of the things we need to solve are political. Uh, employers are taxed very heavily. Uh, imagine a company who wants to move the development center or even headquarters in Estonia and assume that that company motivates their people through stock options and RSU grants regularly like big companies do. This company has to pay Erisodustus Max 68% on all proceedings that their employee, employees have done prior to three years in Estonia. And the company has to pay that. Basically, they have no uh, possibility to, to know when their people are uh, exercising their shares or, or options. So Estonian taxation law today totally eliminates any possibility to any international company to establish their headquarters here. It's not possible because the taxation law punishes the employer by 68% during the uh, first three years of the vesting time. I know it's a little bit complicated and uh, maybe the instruments are not so familiar, but that's another problem. When we address this issue with um, uh, government, then most of people didn't even know what the RSU means, what the vesting is, what is a grant date, what is exercise. They didn't know what those instrument, instruments means, although they were law writers. 
they wrote that law. That's Eastern Europe again for you. Um, the other uh, aspect, uh, which is uh, also political, uh, connected to this, that is that we are now members of all clubs, and similar to Lithuania and Latvia, we are members of like a number of clubs. Uh, we are in Euroclub, uh, European Union, NATO, uh, OSCB, I don't know, VTO, whatever. So a lot of different clubs, but we don't have a club of our own. We don't have a club that other people want to be members of. I don't know, this IT governance club or whatever. Uh, there is a possibility to do that. There is a potential, but uh, we're not focused on that right now at all. Right, uh, the other obstacle, uh, lack of uh, interdisciplinary experience. Uh, so when I talk to students coming to work at Skype, they think they are programmers. Yeah? They think that their value is to create good code. However, they experience quite a shock in the first few months working at Skype. They come to agile environment where the value is maybe listening and communication, active listening skills, where the value is their ability to understand that designer is, is not an artist in terms of um, and that everything that he, cre he creates is an art and I can do you know, my code as I like. But the designer is also has value. They don't understand that the marketing people actually studied their subject for three or five years in school and they are specialists on that. So they come into work with high level of mm, such mental attitude to different professions and th that of course removes all the possibility to interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, why this is important is that because of that our industry, our economy is at the lower end of the value chain creation. Uh, the leading positions are somewhere else. We are putting things together that other people invented, is the very simple terms. And how we put them together, we are not deciding, but somebody else in Sweden, in London, in, in uh, California is, is making decisions about. Uh, the, some of the skill set that um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I messed up some of the points. Uh, some of the st skill set that we need, um, we actually don't teach at all. No, for example, product management. So for most Estonian folks, product manager is somebody who knows where to buy cheap and how to sell uh, with some margin, right? They know how, where to order stuff and how to order. But uh, in other parts of the world, product manager is a someone you have to grow into going through technology, business, law, financing, marketing, uh, logistics, etc. Skill set that creates new innovation, new value, new services, not just uses uh, some that others have created. All righty. And uh, Actually, we are, like Baltic states, quite, quite close to societies, to be honest, you know. We, um, we have a huge immigration going on. Last year, minus 10,000 people, so 14,000 people left Estonia. And uh, while people are moving out, taxpayers, value creators, we actually set quotas on people moving in. <laughs> which is like totally, totally rational because if you want to have ex economic growth, you need consumption. If you want the consumption, need, you have people who buy stuff, who pay value added tax, right? So at the, at the time when we lose people, there is about 100,000 people today, Estonians living outside of Estonia. 40,000 of them live in Finland. And they, they are not paying anything to Estonia anymore, of course. They even don't care about Estonia so much anymore. So uh, we should be extremely worried about losing our taxpayers. 
uh, and value creators. Uh, well, poor rail line access, this is a long story already, but, but uh, the last one with the obstacles, and then I turned into more positive note, I promise, will not be only whining, is this guy. So, this guy, of course, uh, I mean, he finished the uh, 18 kilometer uh, cross country ski with the minus 20 or something right now. So, that's how the person looks like after that. So, for all of you, and me included, this guy is a hero, right? This is somebody we should look up to. You know, he took the, he went there and did it, right? For someone from Brazil or Greece or, I don't know, Pakistan, this guy is an idiot. Because he went out there with very cold climate, endangered himself, and, uh, and uh, is now proud about it. It is not logical. It doesn't sound anywhere logical at all, because they, we should avoid going into cold places, because then we get sick and we have problems. Right? So the way we look at ourselves uh, has to change. And we, don't, we can't hear, make those guys heroes in front of people who don't understand that concept. All right, so possible solutions. I've talked about it before and I will keep talking about it. Uh, we need a foreigner's agency, basically. It's an, a body that uh, helps people to assimilate into, us, into our society. Uh, it's uh, uh, basically, if you know expatica.com, it's an uh, Estonian version of expatica.com. Expatic, expat Expatica is a, is a global, uh, no, Europe-wide, I will think so, uh, knowledge base for immigration, basically. It gives you everything. It explains you exactly how Netherlands tax system works. It explains you exactly how, how quickly you should change your driver's license to when you live in Belgium and you come from the US. So, uh, uh, the one side of the job would be assimilate those people, provide customer service for foreigners, sort of personal, personalized services. But the other part would be also that they would know the best what is the story we want to tell to the world. Because they interface with those people who have found Estonia for any reason. And they get that first-hand experience. So we'll take that knowledge from that agency and push it into marketing campaign, basically. Um, other thing I developed at Skype was uh, uh, my biggest uh, fear, so to say, was that somebody somewhere thinks that we can't hire people. I mean, that's when you live in a country that is the size, uh, size of the small town in the US, well, you have to worry about it, right? Uh, that nobody would think that you can't hire. Uh, and uh, I, I pushed a lot the hiring vehicle. And we hired 2012, we hired 100 people, and 80 of them from Estonia uh, to Skype. So I created a value proposition for each market uh, and divided that into the specific skill set as well. Uh, so uh, this is just an example. Uh, this is not the actual concept, but uh, just how it would look like. So it would have a story for. Western Russia, you would have story for Scandinavia, you would have story for uh, South Baltics, uh, Belarus and, and Ukraine. And those claims, those value propositions, they work because they make sense to each of us actually. So we care about our living environment, we care about how much taxes we have to pay, we care about how transparent the economy is and how freely we can move around the, the world. The specific thing, and this was the hardest part to figure out for Western Europe, was that how, what is the value proposition for those guys? What is the value proposition of somebody living in Netherlands or Germany or in the UK? There is a certain element of getting stuff done easier, but this is not the actual value. You know? Those people hire help to get things done, people who earn I don't know, five, 10,000 euros a month. 
right? They hire help, so that's not the, not the problem. But for Western Europe, the value proposition was the speed of development that we are experiencing here. Good example is my dear friend, Karl Heinz. He came to Estonia 2005. He was a university graduate. After eight years, he's uh, one of 1,000 people inside Microsoft. His partner level, um, he's a little bit over 30 years old today. He's extremely smart, very bright guy. Uh, and uh, he's making waves. I mean, he's, he's a world citizen, basically. Um, I don't even want to say his yearly salary. It's huge, right? That only was possible because he came to Estonia. We worked together. He moved up and, and, and advanced his career faster here than any of his friends could do back home in Germany. His the friends who graduated from the same university, which was actually a vocational uh, school, they are still working as a first level line managers at Mercedes and BMW. That's their career. And this guy, uh, they are not like hugely different in terms of the skill set or talent, uh, but this guy experienced a huge career growth. My own example was also very interesting. Uh, all of a sudden, when Microsoft bought Skype, I realized that uh, I'm uh, my boss's boss's boss is Steve Ballmer. Uh, which is uh, in 100,000 people company quite good uh, result, right? So my boss was Mark Gillette, whose boss was Tony Bates, whose boss was Steve Ballman. Uh, again, you interface with people you wouldn't imagine anyone in Western Europe in, in some lower ranking jobs would be able to do. All righty, let's move on. So, um, other thing we need to pay a lot of attention is to develop the, the people networks uh, and utilize those guys who can actually help us and uh, who are actually available and willing to help us. Good example about it is that when Technopolis, that's a development uh, te techno park in the Ülemiste region, right? when they had their sort of a annual meeting where they discussed how we get people here, or how we get companies here into our Technopolis uh, site and so that they can build up stuff and, and we, we earn more money. Then I asked a very simple question. Who in your organization is doing like people and network development? Like who, who has the network? And the guy's like, oh, you, you, no, no around the table, at the end of the day, decided they're not deliberately doing anything about to develop that network. So they're relying on the very, very uh, ad hoc, uh, I don't know, <laughs> uh, I talked to this guy in seminar, but I don't remember how he looked like or what was his name type of behavior, which is a substandard. The guys on the other side, they come to you, they tell who they are. They uh, make sure you know who they are. They connect you with LinkedIn within a half an hour. They, uh, I mean, like, or all over you. And they make sure that they know who you are, are very, very well. And we, on the other side, totally don't have that competence, like Estonians. Well, we have a couple of exceptions, of course. But we don't have that competence. And uh, this is, of course, uh, you know, Awkward because there is a technopolis who wants uh, people to move their companies into their uh, environment, but they don't know anyone. <laughs> so uh, something that we should definitely work on. I'm sorry, technopolis, that I used that example. I'm sorry. It's, uh, it was just so so good. <laughs> right. Uh, the next one is. Um, is uh, something new. I think it has been touched in Estonian press, but I think uh, it hasn't uh, uh, got any good attention yet. I mentioned we have 100,000 people living outside of Estonia. And I know for a fact that we have thousands of people with huge networks in science, in business, in legislation, I mean, everything. Like we have thousands of people in Brussels, for example. 
what they are doing for Estonia today. What are those guys? And this is uncoordinated, totally chaotic. Somebody is doing something, somebody is doing less, etc. But we don't help them to sell us. We don't provide them a toolkit, promotional materials, I don't know, whatever, souvenirs, films. You know what I mean. Uh, basically, what is good about this place and what you can achieve here. And they have that patronism. Well, yeah. they, have, they are the patriots of their country, actually. Although they would say it's better here, but they actually miss their home, of course. So we should recognize that and come halfway, help them to sell us. Maybe even, I don't know, give them money or something. You know, it's, most problems are fixable with lots of cash. Right. Uh, this is also quite uh, important um, because uh, it, it will blow up very soon in our faces. Uh, one of the things uh, I said and I know Press quoted as well was that I'm convinced that I work until I die. I mean, it just happens. I'm, I'm certain of it. So there is no retirement or anything happening in my future. And I believe same happens to you. So if you're not ready to work until you die, you need to reevaluate that situation a little bit. First, there's no money. There's no money to guarantee the 75% of income after you retire. There, is, there isn't any, and there would not be. Second is that if you think about retirement in the 20th century, then most people throughout the 20th century, they worked in monofunctional, uh, stable jobs. Most Americans worked in one company. They earned their pensions in that company. They worked for there for four years. They went uh, to Caribbean cruise. Today, we are moving around all the time. I mean, we are experiencing the world. We are not strangled. We are already in the open world. So when we should retire, we don't want to go into that monofunctional, I sit at my home and uh, walk my dog type of life. We are addicted to getting out there, doing stuff, volunteer stuff, etc. We're addicted to that. And this will be something that makes retirement as a future proposition obsolete. It's not, it's not there anymore, basically. Uh, which means that we have to re-educate ourselves for the skills that are necessary in 20 years. So I'm 39 right now. 20 years. 20 years ago, it was, well, 93. And I, I went into technical, Tampere Technical University to study. A lot happens in 20 years. So we must be very focused on re-educating ourselves. There are two sources. We must bring back people who studied IT sometimes in the past. We must find them, offer them a socially guaranteed way to reinvigorate their skill set and put that, uh, them back to the market. They probably work as a sales representatives or real estate mar marketers or something today. You know, there, there are a lot potential that is po uh, right now hidden, but we can bring back. The other is that we should address those people who made the wrong decision and studied the wrong thing. And we have a lot of lawyers, we have a lot of public uh, administration guys, uh, we have a lot of people who have master in, their, in international business management or something, you know. Like, how is called called? Uh, what is that? <laughs> so, uh, and those people ac actually have a great potential and we must uh, uh, do the program so that they can socially, in a socially guaranteed way, keeping their income, borrowing from future a little bit, and uh, get them back to competitive industries, like IT, for example. The, the other thing is uh, I call a Ge Georgian model, Grusia. So Georgia, uh, if you look at their 
the high officials, uh, they all have like Oxford, Harvard, I don't know, MIT uh, degrees. This is the only way to get into high positions in, in Georgian uh, public administration and government. You need to be very good, like striking good, like totally blown, very good, right? So we need to, and, and we have seen that a little bit happening actually. Uh, some of the folks like Erki um, Rasuk uh, and Aivo um, Adamson, for example, they, have met, they went to government and, and Tavi Kotka, they went to government and they are very good, I am convinced of that, and they are making their efforts there, but we need to start requiring that from those guys. If you have hundreds of people working for you, you need to be very good, and that's it. Mm. The uh, financing. So seed capital is always very local, because seed capital, they have to know the guy, right? So we cannot uh, attract like uh, Finnish uh, uh, angel investors in Estonia. We have some potential already accumulated where we have a potential for angel investors in Estonia as well. And they have actually organized themselves into Estban, Estonian Business Angels Network Group. And those guys are looking for solutions, how to put that money to work so that it would have a faster and more um, uh, at the end. Uh, no, I'm calling it on my own. Uh, they would have a, a faster way to ac accelerate uh, their, their capital uh, into work. And uh, in Finland, for example, today, uh, well, they, the law was um, drafted last year, but beginning of this year, actually, uh, private investor uh, may deduct 50% uh, of uh, uh, their investments are actually, well, the, of their profits, 50% are tax-free if those, those come from angel investor uh, activities. And they are organized also, there are now free angel investor networks in Finland, and they are doing a lot of things, actually. Right. So, that's the uh, end of the solution section. And uh, uh, the other question uh, in your systems there is that, um, is uh, our education sector set up for necessary changes to give better IT education? And uh, I think that's yes and no answer as well. All right, let's get to education. Um, I've worked now a few years with uh, two of our, of our leading universities. Uh, this happened because uh, I was the head of steering committee for IT Academy. And um, I've now accumulated, I believe, more or less the situational awareness of what's happening within universities today. And I know that uh, we are experiencing that situation where, where autonomy has been transferred to stagnation. And um, this is, of course, very um, delegate topic. Uh, however, uh, I believe schools need to be pushed out of the comfort zones. And uh, definitely it, can, it will happen naturally when we, bring in, when we bring in more foreign professors and foreign students, because they require more of those schools. Uh, we also need to uh, push more of those interdisciplinary collaboration programs through. Uh, the initiative was started a few years ago at Tallinn University. I don't know where it has ended up to, but I think it's not on the table anymore so much. But I know for a fact, the fact that in uh, Tallinn Technical University, faculties don't work together. And the, the system, how they set up, eliminates the collaboration because that's all overhead from their perspective. That's how the system is optimized. We also need to build labs that are actually competitive uh, to jobs or workplaces where people go from schools. Uh, we can't have that situation where you go to work for Skype, you are a signal processing engineer, 
you work for Skype, you go into the audio lab that is like, I, mean, I built it myself, it was 300,000 euros. It's a, it's a top notch state of the art equipment in, the, in our office today. It, there is no such place in near, not in politics, maybe in Finland one. But they do a little bit different stuff. So uh, these labs need to be uh, cutting edge. Um, the other very problematic area in IT education is that we have so many different offerings. The biggest reason why people experience dropout within the first year is that they realize that they came, came to study something wrong. It's totally what they didn't expect to. So they were sold something that wasn't true, basically. The impression that they got was wrong. This is a criminal almost. I mean, you, you deceive, deceive people. So um, uh, in order to, do, to solve that problem, the lower level education needs to be a lot more universal and then master's level education will be somewhere, some place where you actually specialize. So I didn't check the Estonian numbers today, but since I was day before yesterday in Lithuania, I checked that in Lithuania you can get higher IT education from 21 schools. I believe if you think about uh, Tallinn uh, University, Tallinn Technical, Tartu, uh, IT College, uh, and about 17 vocational schools that also give IT <coughs> education, and that's also too much. Because the problem there is that teachers are so scarce and so few that most of the teachers are average. So we, we have competent people, but we don't have them enough. So a lot of people get average education via average teachers. And uh, this is another example uh, of mine. I checked at one point uh, uh, at Skype uh, Estonian leadership uh, who were in the Pioneers House and uh, uh, Norte Technico de Maya computer clubs when they were like eight, nine years old. Everyone. Every one of them was part of the IT already when, before they were 10 years old. And uh, this is something that is happening in Estonia as well uh, right now. Uh, luckily, we have, uh, I believe, 80 or 90 those uh, Nuti labors around uh, Estonia and there is uh, more than 650 students in those uh, working, uh, trying to build their robots and, and write software. So this has to be seen in a very, very early age. I myself uh, wrote the first program that I copy-pasted manually from uh, some Russian language book and I had to learn Russian to understand the thing, what I should copy-paste, where to, and then saved it into audio uh, tape. Uh, and that happened, uh, I think, in 86 in Orto Tehniku Right, and um, some, one thing that is already going on a little bit in universities, but um, since we have the mass universities concept, you know, we, we, we get people in, like a lot of people, the same uh, curriculums. Then, actually, people who are there are already, some of the people are more knowledgeable about the subjects than their teachers are. And uh, if you don't recognize that and put those folks into different tracks, hypos here means high potentials. We have to put those hypos into different tracks and push them through universities quicker, like really quick. I mean, very quick, like not uh, wasting any time, basically. So, and then average people see what good looks like and they start to work uh, a lot more heavily. Uh, the other thing that is, uh, I didn't mention it here, but uh, this is a uh, very problematic is that in uh, Estonian universities, you don't have to study much. Like in the materials you have to go through, the work you have to do in the labs or collaboration work with other teams, it's, it's doable, you know? You, you work uh, during the day, it's, you can basically do. So you can go through the program without any 
actually learning anything. So folks who have studied abroad, they tell about that the Estonian students have to study about 50% less than people in, in uh, uh, other universities uh, where they have been to. So uh, one uh, solution to that uh, is our IT Academy initiative, of course, <laughs> which uh, we uh, and the uh, uh, Estonian Ministry of Education, Economics um, and um, uh, ITL and uh, uh, Estonian uh, HITSA, which is uh, English name is probably, uh, it's a foundation for IT uh, education. You know? And um, uh, called together, so uh, we now have one year past us uh, and um, of course, it's too early to, to know exactly what has been the outcome, but uh, the investments into this uh, are quite significant and uh, we are actually uh, addressing two topics. One is the up to up level, the IT education in those two universities, Stalin Univ Technical University and uh, Tartu University, and uh, also reduce the dropout rate and increase the, the amount of people who finish their studies with nominal time. So how we do that is that we channel about 60% of the funds into uh, up-leveling the IT education by hiring foreign professors, building labs and such. And then about 40% of the resources go to, uh, to pay stipendiums uh, to people so they can actually afford to focus to study, uh, so they wouldn't have to work so much uh, in parallel of their studies. And uh, this was it, actually. The summary is that we have issues, but there are solutions. It's only about start, starting to do them. And uh, that, of course, means motivation, and uh, motivation uh, I'm here to give you. So hopefully uh, this has uh, has been relevant topics for you. It's definitely very important topics for me. And uh, thank you. I did. I did.